pretty old fashioned as you see. I, I, I don't use the PowerPoint thing. You know, I was once in a school and worked and there was a guy who told me like, have you ever thought about this? I was like, what? Honestly, where's the power and what's the point? <laughs> and <laughs> I've been thinking about that since that day. And I don't think that you can, you know, share uh, the stuff that I'm interested in, you know, human rights and identity and how we people, you know, inter interact with each other on an intellectual level with a couple of graphs and stuff like that. I think you have to be personal. And I will take my time, the 10 minutes I have here, to be personal and tell you a story. Uh, I'm 25 years old and my name is Leo Rasak and I work as a strategic uh, advisor to some of the big companies in Sweden when it comes to diversity questions. Uh, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to give you a subject subjective perspective on the topic of today's event, uh, human rights and identity. And I think it's worth to point out one thing, and that is that the things that I share with you here today, it's my subjective truth. It's not the truth. I'm so sick and tired of everyone saying that they have the patent on truth, you know. This is my point of view on the topic of today. Stories like this, okay. I'm a young guy, I'm born in Sweden, but my father is from Bangladesh. So I, I have often asked myself a question about identity. I mean, who am I in Sweden? I'm like an immigrant. When I go to Bangladesh, I'm like the Swede. And it's caused a bit of trouble in my life, you know. But back in 2002, there was a murder in Sweden. There was a g girl called Fadime. She got murdered from her of, uh, of her father because they didn't like the way she was living. She had a Swedish boyfriend, and they came from another part of the world. Uh, that, that, you know, brought up a big discussion in Sweden about honor-related violence and stuff like that. And uh, at a place where I've been working a long time in Stockholm called Frishuset, it's a big youth recreation center, they caught up this question, and they want to do something uh, about this honor-related violence stuff, you know? So they founded a project, and this project was supposed to work, uh, how do you say, uh, preventing these kinds of... of, of uh, tragical incidents, you know? And they started to build up a theater scene where they could go out and talk to young people about these uh, questions. They started to build up like uh, a big uh, support center for the girls who, who, who lived in this uh, situation. But then they understood a thing like, hey, if you want to make a change when it comes to this picture in the, in the, in the long-term perspective, we have to work with men because it's men who is oppressing women. And I mean, if you change the attitudes of men, then you've made a big change when it comes to this question. So then they raised the question at this place called Free Suset. And uh, long story short, they founded a project. And this project uh, uh, was supposed to work with men and men's attitudes, you know. And this is where I come into the picture, you know, because I grew up in a segregated suburb in Stockholm called Nushbori. And uh, Nushbori is a pretty rough area. It's a lot of immigrants, a lot of people who don't... Uh, integrate well into the society and so on and so on. And uh, next to this uh, suburb is another suburb called Fitya. So Nushpol and Fitya are pretty close to each other. And uh, at Free Suset, they wanted to reach out to the young people out in these suburbs. But they didn't, didn't know how to do, you know? So a man got in contact with another man who got in contact with a third man and so on and so on. And finally, we heard at, the, at the, our youth recreation center in Nushpol, where I grew up, that there was supposed to be a debate at this place called Free Suset about unrelated violence. And the guys from Fitya, they were supposed to be there. So we were also supposed to be there. So we went, me and my friends, you know, I was like 16, 17 years old, we went to Free Susa, there were no debate at all, you know. So we didn't understand anything, but they, they gave us free food, so we were pretty pre pleased, you know. <laughs> so, so we went back home, and like a w week after, this man who wanted to, to collect all the young people, he called us again, he was like, hey guys, do you want to get back? And we were, yeah, le yeah, yeah, if you buy us food. <laughs> he was like, okay, and we went there again. And at that time, uh, we were only the guys from Mushbori. At, at the in the room, you know, and then he asked us the questions. It was like, guys, when you marry, when you marry, when you grow up, do you want to marry a girl who's a virgin? And everybody in the room were like, yeah, of course. And then he, he posted another question, like, and how is your sexual life going? <laughs> and all of us were like, it's going fine, man, it's going fine. And then the third question were like, okay, but why is it like that? Why is it okay for you to have sex, but the person you want to marry are not supposed to have had any sex. 
And we looked at him like this, you know, because you couldn't use the traditional defense system that you use in Sweden. Like you look at a Sweden and are like, hey, are you a racist? And the guy just, or the girl just walks away or what do you know about my culture and so on. He was a black man from Africa, so I couldn't say, hey, are you a racist? I, w I had to answer the question. Why was it supposed to be like this? And, you know, the strange thing was that we were people from all over the world in this room. You know, people from Arab, uh, Iraq, Iran, from Kurdistan, from Bangladesh, from Sweden. Everybody thought that it was supposed to be this way, but when we s were supposed to give an answer, no one came up with an answer. You know, one was like, you know, this is culture, and another one was like, no, this is religion, and a third one was like, no, this is just my grandfather's old things, you know, we have it in, in his mind. So we couldn't agree on why we thought that it was supposed to be this way. So we fought with the man, but at the same time, we told him, like, hey, you're pretty interesting, we want to meet you again. And I understood one thing that day, uh, and it's a question about identity. I understood that the key to my success, if there is a such a key, it must be a question about identity. Because if I don't know who I am, how am I supposed to know where to go? You know, I'm, I'm one person in Sweden, another person when I go abroad, a third person in school, or f or, you know, and so on and so on. So we were like, hey, we want to meet you again, and we want to talk about our identity. And he was happy, of course. And he came out to our place where we grew up in Nusbori, and he started to have these conversations with us about Sweden and the Swedish system. And, you know, he asked us a question, like, well, what do you think about Sweden? And all of us were like, Sweden is shit. And he was like, why? We were like, it's just shit, you know. They take 30% of all our salaries, and they don't give us anything. And uh, he was like, why? Do you really think that? Yeah. And then he d drew a line on the board with 0, 25, 65, 80. And it was like, now we're going to talk about your life in Sweden. You don't get anything in Sweden? No, we don't get anything in Sweden. Don't talk shit, guys. It costs us money on the hospital when you get born, you know? So you get a little bit. And what do you get more? We had this big discussion. We don't get anything. Yeah, we get a bit. We get school. We get school. We get, I mean, health care. You get tooth care. You get... Uh, student money every month. You know, in Sweden, actually, you, r you get like this rock huvel. I don't know how you say it in, Swe in English, you know. You get this razor blade at the post office, you know. So you get, you get a lot of things in Sweden before you turn 25. And what hap happens after that? You know, we're not going to be anything and so on. The discussion went on. And he was like, yeah, you're going to be something. You go out to work, you know. And then when you work, Sweden, Sweden, it's like this, you know, when you get out into work, you pay 30% of your taxes back here because the society has invested like 18 million crowns to make you this person who can pay back the taxes and you invest into the future because in the future, I mean, you want to die easily and happy, isn't it so? And then you pay like 30% here so you get some service from the system along the way. And you know, in five minutes, Sweden became a perfect country. You know, I'm, I can still watch this model and be like, hey, somebody has really done the math, you know. <laughs> but I think we sometimes we take for granted that the pe persons who grew up in Sweden are supposed to understand this just, you know, by themselves, by heart. It wasn't like that for me because I didn't have any grown-up influences who could point the right direction. But we started a discussion and a debate in this group about identity, about culture. And I think sometimes in Sweden, when we look at pe people from all on over the world, we have this e elitistic perspective. We watch them, these people and like, okay, you come here now, but you have to do the trip, you know, the trip that we have done. You know, for an example, in Sweden in 1886, they, they founded a law that the Swedish uh, fathers could no longer decide which men their daughters were supposed to marry. Before that, uh, we changed Lisa to Kalle for three cows, just like in Iraq, it was the same thing. Like in 1921, the Swedish woman got the right to vote. In 1926, Astrid Lindgren, the famous author, had to go to Denmark to give birth to a child because she wasn't married. Now we're going to print her on the 20, 20 crown thing. After that, uh, we had like a, how do you say, a working movement in Sweden, we had a sexual revolution, we had a digital society, and now we're here today. It's taken us 140 years to build up the system, but sometimes we take it for granted and think that we have done the trip. I don't think that we have done the trip. I mean, we don't even have, a, have had a, 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 a woman who's leading the country yet. We still have more persons on the stock who's named U1 than we have uh, women running the companies. We have still have, I mean, boys and girls growing up in this country with the same education and the same job. The boys get, on average, about 2,500 crowns more every month just because they're boys. One of the, I mean, most common 
crime in Sweden today is a man coming home beating his wife. So, I mean, we've done something, but we haven't done the trip. And for us, it was interesting to see this, you know, historical perspective on the evolution of Sweden or whatever you're supposed to call it. And that made us feel a bit interested because when I grew up, often a lot of people, you know, a lot of old people, they made, they made me feel like I was a bad person just because I had some values in my bagage that, that wasn't so good, you know. And then we started to put Sweden in a in like global perspective. O E C D from 2010 are these numbers from individual countries, collective countries, religious countries, and secular countries. Okay, how many of you have been to a developing country the last year? I don't know one, two. How many of you have opinions when it comes to developing countries? No one. <laughs> a couple of you guys. I was in Bangladesh one year ago started up a, a, a thing there. Pretty interesting country, you know, 150 million people is living there. 120 of them live on, on an average of less than $2 a day. You shit in a hole on the ground. You, you, you make food over an open fire and so on and so on. One day when I was there, it was like 39 persons who froze to death because it was only four degrees. And I told my father when I was there, I was like, shit, dad, if I was supposed to live here, under these circumstances and conditions, of course, I want a family who gives me love and I want at least one God to believe in. Or else I wouldn't, you know, manage the day-by-day -day life. And I think that's the answer on why most of the developing countries are here in the global perspective. And then, you know, the world develops and you have South America and you have Europe and you have America here, believe much in themselves and God. And then you have the Scandinavian countries, you have Norway, Denmark, you have Finland, and the Swedes. What trip have we done in the 140 years? I mean, we're like the most exclusive country in the world because we're the only countries outside of the graph. We are there. We're the most individual and secularized country in the world. Sometimes when we look at other people, I think we take for granted and they, they will do this trip, you know, by heart. Like, oh, you guys who come here, you're from here. Now it's fun, fun that you're here, or fun or fun, but now you're here. Is it okay that you do the travel? You know, it took us 140 years, but you can do it in a course. It's called SFE, you know, Swedish for immigrants. <laughs> and if you just do that course, everything will turn out fine, you know. And, and I, I don't believe that it's so good always to be up in this right corner, but I think we focus on, you know, pulling people over there, and that's not so good, I think. And the last thing we did at this trip was, you know, take off our baggage, you know, what you call culture. Because a lot of people talk to me about culture class clashes and stuff like that when I grew up. But I never understood, you know, what the meaning of a culture class is. If someone here in the audience does, please come down and write one up for me, you know. I don't know how it looks like. But we took off this baggage culture or, or whatever you want to call it, pulled it out and, you know, watched what is inside here. I mean, we had this, we found a lot of good things, food, uh, hospitality, and so on and so on. And of course, bad things, you know. And in our case, we found out that, hey, often all of us, we, are, we have this like black stain in our luggage, this patrical way of thinking who's not really fitted for society in the first world, you know. And uh, you can change that. You can admit that this is a problem and you can, you can get rid of it. And, and when you've done that, you can feel free with your new luggage and uh, we did that you know we understood that this uh, black stain is not unique for afghanistan or iraq or bangladesh it's common in all all uh, societies over the whole world just much less up here because they have you know made human rights to law human rights is law here and i think that often we just don't understand that, but it's not law here. And uh, just go there and you understand why people think about other things. So when we admitted that this was a big problem for us, we got rid of this and then we started to understand that all the other things that people complain about my, my, my way of behaving with my body or the way I speak Swedish, it's not a problem, you know. The only thing that's a problem is the things that c clashes with the Swedish law. And I think that all the Swedes and all the people in the world should be able to point on that instead of saying, hey, you're just a bad immigrant or you're this and that. 
point on the real problem. And after that, you know, after we admitted that this is a problem, we just changed behavior. And then this guy who started to work with us in the beginning, he was like, hey guys, now you learned a lot. Don't you want to cause a change for other persons? And we were like, no. And he was like, yeah, we were like, no. He was like, you give, you give 500. We were like, okay. <laughs> and then we got 500 for talking about these questions to other young persons in Stockholm. And we went to the school and we had this lecture about identity, about culture, about human rights. And, uh, you know, it went really good. And then I got a question of, of from Free Sisters to continue to do that and continue with this work. So I did it. And we managed to create a project where young guys and girls take, uh, uh, take action when it comes to the question about honor-related violence and goes out to schools. And it's like 220 young guys and girls in Sweden who's finished this project today. And it's also active around in Europe. And for me it's been an honor to be a part of this and it's really helped me throughout my career today and uh, as i told you in the speech if you don't know who you are i don't think that you will ever understand where you're supposed to go uh, so that's my point of view to this big discussion that we have here today and i'm really pleased uh, and i thank you edna for inviting me so thank you guys <laughs>